Well, I guess I'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, thank you guys so much for uh, getting up an hour earlier and being here. I appreciate that this morning. I was a little, uh, little concerned whether we have any folks show up at this time slot, but I appreciate you being here. My name is Brian Goral, and I'm from the University of Central Oklahoma. And uh, we have a facility there called the UCO Jazz Lab, and it's the home of our jazz studies program. And I've been there for uh, 14 years now, and uh, just a wonderful place to work and get to work with a lot of great students. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here today and, uh, and uh, get to talk to you a little bit and maybe play a little bit. I, I want to introduce Dr. Ben Hoagland, uh, who most of you have heard already this week. Uh, fantastic musician, and I'm uh, thrilled to have him here. So yeah, give him a hand. So I thought I'd start this morning uh, by just playing something uh, and see if we can kind of get ourselves awake a little bit and then maybe I'll be a little more cohesive in the things that I talk about. So we're going to play Stella by Starlight.
No, that's, uh, that's one of the most beautiful things about this music uh, for me is uh, the opportunity to play with different people. We played together once on one tune on Thursday, and then other than that, this is our first time to play together, but there's this common language, I think, that we share, and uh, really cool stuff. So, this lecture this morning is about the idea of jazz vocabulary, and uh, this is a huge subject. And I've been, and I just wanted to start by saying this, I've been incredibly inspired this week. I've heard so many great performances, heard you the other day, uh, just so many wonderful musicians. And uh, I think this is such a wonderful thing for the saxophone world, to see so many uh, players coming together from so many different diverse backgrounds, kinds of playing. Um, I teach classical saxophone and jazz saxophone both, and uh, live in both of those worlds, and uh, have a tremendous respect for everybody that cares about this instrument and puts the time in on it. So. Uh, uh, I've just been absolutely floored uh, hearing you and Rich Perry last night on uh, Central Park West. Um, the concert was just amazing. So this lecture is sort of geared not so much uh, to those of you that are already very seriously studying jazz uh, as if they're going to tell you anything. I think that's a revelation, but maybe it's just a way of organizing and thinking about things and demonstrating a bit of sort of the pedagogy of how I approach teaching this music. and. Uh, working with lots of different students that are at lots of different ability levels. Um, been very um, fortunate to work with some amazing students, and then I also have people that are really just getting started in jazz uh, in my studio as well. So when you talk about the idea of vocabulary uh, at the beginning, vocabulary relates to language. And jazz, to me, and from my experience, jazz is a unique language. Um, and it's, uh, it has all the idiosyncrasies of a language. Does anybody in here speak a language besides English fluently? Surely somebody speaks something fluent. What do you speak? I speak German. German. Okay, so can you say something clever about saxophone in German just so I can hear you say it? Uh, Not too long because I have a short memory. Say that again. Okay, now who wants to take a stab that doesn't speak German in repeating what he just said? <laughs> Say it one more time. I'm going to sound awful. It's a schick über den saxophon. It's a schick über den saxophon. See, he's laughing, right? Right. So I tried to repeat what he just said back, and it was awful. And I apologize. My apologies uh, for that. But I think that's um, is a good analogy to what jazz language is. There's no one aspect to it. Uh, notes on the page are a small part of it. Articulation, phrasing, sound concept. Uh, where he places accents when he said that sentence has everything to do with whether it sounds right or not. Uh, in some languages, unless you can roll your R's, for example, or make certain sounds, you can't even get close to it. And I kind of think of jazz in that same manner, uh, that you go about learning it as a language. And uh, it's a process that really you can't just do in a few days. I mean, if I was going to be serious about uh, speaking German fluently, I mean, what are some things that I would do? Well. I would probably want to study the language. I would probably want to take some classes. And I could take classes for two or three years in German. And there's no way I would be fluent in German until I made that decision that I was going to move somewhere where I was being forced to speak the language all the time. And then for me, it became an issue of, well, you know, if I need to order food, then I need to be able to speak. And then it would become really important to me, and I would figure it out. But it's just that, that idea of completely inundating yourself with the language. Um, that is, uh, is at the core of learning this. And I think that analogy is super, super important. So some ideas here um, are how do we break down this language into different categories, different things that we can look at. Um, to me, the most important element in jazz music uh, is rhythm, the rhythmic nature of jazz. And the rhythmic nature of jazz is absolutely different than any other style of music. Um, in most forms of early classical music, you know, we think of rhythm in those contexts as being sort of monorhythmic. In other words, everything is divisible and, and broke down where there's one basic uh, pattern. So if I'm looking at a whole note or two half notes or four quarters or eight, 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 eight notes, et cetera, et cetera, it's sort of this monorhythmic concept. Jazz, by its very nature, is polymetric music. And there's a uh, phrase I like called polymetricity, which means that there's multiple meters that are always going on at the same time. So that implies that there's something really different uh, right from the get-go on this uh, to work with. Uh, there's a really great piano player in New York named Mike Longo. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. He was Dizzy Gillespie. He, he's a very eclectic guy. Uh, so if you've never heard of Mike Longo, yeah, you ought to look him up. He's um, 
very interesting, uh, very interesting eclectic guy, but he was Dizzy Gillespie's piano player uh, for the better part of 20 years uh, towards the end of Dizzy's career. And he was uh, fascinated by Dizzy Gillespie and his teachings, because Dizzy was known as being a great teacher. He loved to talk about this music, uh, and he, would, he had a, a way that was very old school of teaching. Instead of explaining something you know, in detail, he would just give you one little tidbit and say, go think about that. You know? And that was kind of the way a lot of the masters uh, taught. But uh, Mike Longo uh, absolutely loved Diz and spent uh, all uh, the last better part of the last 20 years now since Dizzy passed away uh, putting together his teachings into, um, into a series that he calls The Rhythmic Nature of Jazz. And uh, it's something I really would encourage you to check out. I know there's musicians that go to New York to study with Mike and regardless of whether they're a piano player, or a saxophone player, or a trombone player, when they go and study with him they play hand drums. And they spend all their time on hand drums, and he spends a lot of time talking about understanding the rhythmic nature of jazz. Uh, so polymetricity at its core means that there's multiple meters going on at the same time. And it's interesting, you know, in different contexts, different groups of instruments, but just uh, saxophone and piano playing together, it's a different rhythmic context than if we had a bass player and a drummer working with us also. Uh, but there was different things going on there. I think we threw in a 5-4 bar <laughs> once or twice. Did we? <laughs> that may have been, I think that's what I did, but, uh, you know. Uh, we're, listening. we're listening. We were trying to listen to each other, absolutely. So, um, but the idea, you know, and I could spend the entire time talking about this, and I really just wanted to throw this out. It's not even necessarily in my notes, but um, uh, just this idea of studying rhythm in a very deep uh, way. So, you know, he talks about the fact that, and he uses as an example what he calls a rhythmic pile, where, where he'll show that there's a bass rhythm, and really in jazz, a lot of people think of the bass rhythm in jazz of being swing eighth notes, and it's really not. It's 12-8. The bass rhythm of everything is based on 12-8, on and so he'll, you know, at the hand drum will play these different rhythms, and you can hear different flows that are happening on top of that. And uh, like I said, I didn't necessarily plan on uh, going too deep into that, but I did want to mention that, because I think that in jazz education in general, uh, all around the country, that uh, all kinds of schools do a fantastic job about teaching harmony and teaching chord scale theory, uh, you know, understanding uh, saxophone specific things like articulation and tone quality and all that, but we don't necessarily always do as good a job of talking about and thinking about the rhythmic nature of this music and how to break it down. Uh, so I really recommend that, Mike Longo's Rhythmic Nature of Jazz, and does a good job of talking about that. So in my notes here I talk about um, Jazz is first and foremost a unique language and style. There's a common, ever-evolving language of melodic fragments, articulations, and phrasing used by every important jazz saxophonist throughout the history of America's great art music. Great saxophonists do not simply replay these same licks throughout their career, but instead use this common vocabulary as a starting point for developing their own unique style. Uh, in my opinion, if an aspiring saxophonist does not fully internalize a certain degree of this important vocabulary, during their developmental stage, they're not being true to the music and educated listeners will immediately identify their playing as immature. Improvisation exists in many different styles of music worldwide, so although jazz relies heavily on improvisation, the jazz student must utilize some of this common vocabulary when improvising in order to sound authentic and learn the style. Um, there's different, differing opinions about this, and I, and I love discussing this with people. I don't think, I never turned this back on, did I? I'm sorry. I see it's easy to forget that. I think this is just for the recording. Um, there's a lot of differing opinions about this idea. I think that there's a frame of thought that some people have that, uh, you know, you learn a hundred different licks and then you just stream those together and that's jazz improvisation. Uh, it's, I don't, I don't, I, I think it is jazz, but I think when somebody does that to a high degree, I think it's not so much art as much as it is high craftsmanship. You know, there's a difference between trying to create art and being a great craftsman. A craftsman is somebody who can build things and put things together. So, you know, there's people that do that very well. Um, in my opinion, it's better instead of learning 100 licks and stringing them together, how about learning 10 licks and finding 100 different ways to use those licks? You end up with a greater comprehension about the music as a result of that, but it's a creative process and you're still being true to this idea of vocabulary while you're doing that. Um, I heard in, uh, in Ben's solo, you know, a uh, half dozen different things that immediately when he played that, I identified what that was. I don't think I could... And, and vice versa. Yeah. And I don't think I could consciously uh, describe it, but it, you know, there was a conversation that happened as a result of us having that common language. And all of you that are, uh, that are, that are really serious about this music understand that idea very well. So, uh, Hal Galper, a uh, great piano player, Hal Galper, uh, is one of my favorite players. And there's a series of videos on YouTube that... Um, 
it's the jazz or the, uh, the the jazz video guy. You guys ever seen the jazz video guys deal on YouTube? Is um, Brett? I forget his last name. Uh, he's at all the Gen conferences and he tapes everything. And so he put a series of uh, uh, workshop lectures up that Hal Galper did, talking about this and a variety of other subjects. And uh, I just absolutely loved uh, these videos and the way Hal Galper talked about music and, and about jazz in particular. So much so, we brought him to the Jazz Lab as a guest artist a couple years ago and, and got to hang out with him and study with him. But I have a quote in here, uh, what Hal Galper says in one of these master classes. He says, you need the vocabulary to do the process. However, the process itself teaches you the process. So what he's referring to here is actually improvising the process of jazz. In other words, you learn it by doing it not by intellectualizing it or any other way. In order to do the process, you need something to use, which is the vocabulary. So the more vocabulary you have, the better you can use the process, the better you can teach yourself the process. This is a music that teaches itself by doing it, but if you don't have vocabulary to do it, you can't learn it. It's as simple as that. And uh, what a great quote, uh, great quote. And I put the link on there for the, the YouTube. You can search it and find it really easily. Uh, but he's very clear about that. And actually, my first... Um, um, first uh, time that I heard about Mike Longo was through Hal Galper's discussions that I looked him up and found out about um, his teaching and about this idea of really studying rhythm in a really clear way. So that to me is, is at the core of this. You know, So how do you learn jazz language? How do you learn to speak any language? I like this analogy. Do we throw an English grammar book into a baby's crib and expect them to become fluent in English? No. I mean, how do we learn to speak a language? It's a, a, a very natural thing that happens, and it happens through the process of imitation. Um, Clark Terry took everything about jazz education and was able to boil it down into three words. You know, and if I could get to that point. I bet I know what these three words are. Imitation, assimilation, innovation. There it is. See? Clark Terry. Uh, when I was a college student, we hosted the Clark Terry camps for four years, and that was profoundly life-changing for me. Uh, being around Clark and all the other guys that were in that band. Um, and yeah, that's exactly right. So Clark is basically saying that you have to go through this imitative stage uh, where you're really listening in a profound way to players that, uh, that mean something to you and, uh, and seeking to imitate everything that you can. And that's a challenge. It's a challenge because most of us, myself included, uh, grow up in a, grew up in a musical environment where we're traditional band kids, right? We start out and from the very beginning, everything we're doing is based on basically visual interpretation of music. And so asking somebody to interpret something orally is a different kind of challenge. And um, so that first step of, of imitation uh, is really just deciding that I want to be able to play like Charlie Parker. I want to be able to play this line. I can remember um, when I was in high school, I think, uh, the first Charlie Parker solo that I learned was Yardbird Suite that I really like, and then there was this phrase in it, uh, and I don't, I don't know that I play it that much when I'm improvising anymore, but I still remember very clearly, because I just love this. And I can't really tell you why I like that, it just it makes me smile now when I hear it, it's just uh, a beautiful melodic line. And uh, so that was the very first phrase that I sort of internalized and said, well, you know, if I can play that starting on an E, can I play that starting on an F sharp, can I play that starting on an A? And it was just a very conscious process of, okay, if I can play it in that key, then what if it's in a hard key? You know, and learned that throughout the range of the horn. And then for a while when I was playing, that was like, you know, every solo, every eight bars, you know, and people around me going, what's wrong with you? It's like, I don't know, I just like that. You know, so it was kind of, to me, it was like a baby step in that direction, but that was the, uh, the beginning of the process for me. Uh, and so how many of you have done that, those of you that are, that are serious jazz students, have taken patterns and, and phrases and played them in all the different keys? Yeah. So it's a pretty universal idea. Um, and so kind of what I'm doing in, in, in this lecture in the ne next part of this is talking about a process of, of going through that and how you think about doing that and how you do that. Um, so on, along the subject of imitation, um, I feel like... In the world we live in today, we are inundated with so much media. There's so much access. I mean, I can pick my phone up and listen to 50 million different songs. You know, everything is available to us all the time. And at the same time that that's really cool, I think it's actually a problem for a lot of younger students today because we're sort of on information overload a lot of times. When I uh, 
uh, was starting out and uh, I wanted to get a jazz record that I was interested in. I had to go to a local record store and there were records back then, you know, vinyl records. And uh, there were many, many times that I ordered a record and I'd wait two weeks. And the record would come in and I'd go pick it up and then I would go home and put the record on and it was an event. I mean, it was like an actual event to sit down and put this record on and listen to it. And, uh, and then, I, you know, on that record, there might be one cut that, that really spoke to me in some way. And then I'd listen to that over and over and over again. And I think one of the things that's getting lost with some students is that, you know, in their attempt to learn this music, they're listening to all kinds of different things all the time. And I think it's really more important, at least at the beginning stage, that you find something that you really like and you get deeply involved with that, even if it's just one track. Um, and I talk about this idea of passive listening versus active listening. Passive listening is something that we all do. I mean, I'm sure there's some of you right now that are a bit zoned out because I'm as exhausted as you probably are with the time change. Passive listening, you know, the car, uh, car radio's on, but you're carrying on a conversation. Active listening is a much deeper thing. I mean, I love to listen to music and headphones. Uh, you know, it's like before I go to bed, I'll put on headphones in a dark room, and I'm just totally zoning out everything else. And it's amazing what you can hear if you just give yourself that opportunity to do that. So I would say that. Now, what do you listen to? And this is something that Hal Galper talks about uh, quite a bit as well that I think is, uh, is much better put than I can explain it. But uh, what do you listen to? Well, he says, and I agree, that you should listen for what elicits an emotional response from you. You know, uh, part of being true to yourself as an artist is to be true about what you really like. So, for example, you know, there might be people telling you that you really need to listen to Charlie Parker. And you might listen to Charlie Parker in, in peer pressure and, you know, everything else. Oh, this is great. Uh, but then there might be, you know, I don't know. I just don't, I don't like this, you know. And that's okay. And I think you have to be honest with that. Uh, I know when I was starting out that there was, a, there was that kind of process where, uh, you know, I remember my first John Coltrane recording I heard was my favorite things. Now, if that's your first thing you've heard, and I was... <laughs> you know, 14, 15 at the time, it was kind of overwhelming, you know, and, and what he was doing, and I didn't understand anything of what he was doing. I thought, well, like his tone, this doesn't make sense, you know. But then I heard David Sanborn record at that point, and I mean, I, you know, I was a, uh, in high school in the 80s, so this was kind of that generation, but um, gosh, I heard David Sanborn playing on this live recording uh, album called Straight to the Heart, and it's just, you know, a lot of, a lot of David Sanborn's playing, I love his playing, I mean, very blues influence playing, uh, a lot of soul, I mean, you know, I think one of the highest things that anybody can do is to be able to play one note and somebody to recognize their tone. Clark Terry was that way, Clark could play one note on trumpet and you say that's Clark Terry. David Sanborn can play one note on alto and you say that's David Sanborn, so, uh, but I remember that was what I listened to, but I was like, oh, I shouldn't be listening to this, but I really liked it anyway. And the first thing I ever actually transcribed was what he played on this recording of Straight to the Heart, this bluesy, you know, uh, solo in, e, in concert E-flat, you know, and I think to this day some of my core stuff still comes from that influence. So you have to be true to yourself. So if you find something that you really love that elicits an emotional response from you, that's what you ought to be listening to. And I'd add one last thing to that. What if you go out and check out all different kinds of recordings of jazz, all different kinds of saxophone players that are playing jazz, and you don't like any of it? then you probably shouldn't be doing this. I mean, I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a very honest way because there's plenty of jazz saxophone players out there at this point. And I think that, that, that being honest with yourself is really important. So that's all I'll say about that. But I think uh, that's something that doesn't get talked about uh, nearly enough. So once you've listened to something and you find things that you really love, then the process of transcription comes up. And transcription itself, uh, learning things by ear, can be a very daunting task. Um, I know it was for me. Uh, for sure. And there's no better way to develop your ear faster. There's no better way uh, to get a deep understanding of this music than by transcribing something uh, that you've listened to off a recording by doing something orally. However, transcription takes a whole lot of different forms. Um, so why I think that's something that's obvious to all of us, what is not always talked about as much is that transcription also happens in real time every time you're communicating with other musicians. I mean, there's no doubt I've learned something already from playing with Ben this morning. You know, his touch uh, is, a, is a different touch than, than somebody else that I've played with. So then it affects the way I play, and that communication changes as a result. And uh, that's something else that Mike Longo talked about. Mike Longo grew up in Florida, uh, and he talks about uh, when he was, I guess, 16 years old. You know, he was, had been identified as a piano player that really had, uh, you know, some abilities and had a good ear. And he had gotten a church gig where he was playing uh, in 
like a gospel oriented church where he was playing more by ear and he had a knack for that. And uh, so as a result of that, he got referred as a sub on a gig and the sax player on the gig was Cannonball Adderley. And this is before Cannonball, you know, had sort of been discovered in New York and was being recorded because Cannonball was a band director. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Cannonball was a band director in Florida. And uh, so he finds himself on this gig uh, playing piano for Cannonball Adderley and he, uh, uh, you know, talked about well, how amazing that was. He became his regular piano player for a couple of years. And he said that his concept of rhythm and how he comps, he said, he said this also, he said, you know, Cannonball wasn't famous yet, but Cannonball still sounded exactly like Cannonball. So he said, you know, his touch, his sense of syncopation, how he played at the piano, he said everything changed during that time. You know, and it happens in a natural, organic way. And so then he looks back and goes, wow, I'm a totally different pianist now. Well, that's transcription. You know, and that's the apprenticeship process. Um, and one of the things that's unfortunate about jazz is that the apprenticeship process in some ways has broken down because the way a lot of people learned this music uh, for generations was on the bandstand. You know, having the opportunity to play with people, filling in, subbing, you know, being scared to death when you're you know, playing with somebody that's much more experienced than you. And um, so one thing I would say about that is that you look for every single opportunity you possibly can to play with other people more experienced than you, less experienced than you. Ideally, you play with older musicians who are more experienced and you get the opportunity to, uh, to learn and grow from them as a result of that too. So that's transcription as well. Uh, I'm, piano, I'm also a piano player, by the way, and I would make a plug that if you're serious about uh, playing jazz, I think it's absolutely critical that you play the piano. I mean, it's a requirement for all of my students and anybody that's a music major. I don't think you can be a music major anywhere uh, here in the United States and not have a certain amount of piano proficiency. Um, but I think that's really important, and it's not just for the harmony aspect, but I think harmony is obvious, but it's just as important for the rhythmic aspect of it, too. Learning how to sit down and be able to comp for a soloist. If I'm teaching a lesson and I need to sit down and play the piano uh, with somebody playing a tune, I think that's a critical skill that helps uh, with that, too, because it teaches you rhythm. So I'm saying a lot of stuff, throwing a lot of ideas out there. Uh, do you guys have any, any thoughts about anything that I've said so far before I move on to some other, other aspects of this? Yeah. So you were talking about instead of learning a hundred clicks, just kind of basically take ten and like really get them all well keyed and use them in a hundred different ways. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by a hundred different ways? Well, that was that, that was how Galper's quote. I don't know that I could demonstrate a hundred different ways, but I think there's a very organic thing that happens that's a very compositional process that if you you know, if I took the lick that I uh, that I just gave an example of, I mean, you know, this is a lick that works over a major chord, it works over a two five one. Um, and so, you know, I learned this lick and for a while that was what I played, but it, it's very possible if I'm playing now, I might find myself in the middle of that, but it might go somewhere else. I might be a... You know, it might start off that way and then it might move in a different direction. It might... You know, so I think, I think that, that there's a conscious practice of that and then there's also an unconscious practice of that. Um, if you've learned enough vocabulary that you know have some tools that you can sit and improvise, uh, then you're gonna find those variations. And by the way, that's one of the biggest mistakes uh, that jazz students seem to make uh, is that they practice on chords, scales, tunes, yada, yada, yada. They do all these things, but they don't actually practice improvising. I mean, I, I know I fell into that trap for a while because there's so much to work on. I mean, if you're a serious student of jazz, I think however much time in any practice session that you spend doing other things, tone, technique, all those kinds of things, you spend that much time improvising too. Because that process uh, that Hal Galper is referring to also, you learn the process by doing it. So I think that that happens maybe more in an organic way than uh, just as a result of you consciously sitting down and saying, okay, now I'm going to start this note up a half step or, or whatever. Uh, at least that's my thought on it. So, another, you got a question? I just wanted to ask what you said about the piano. Um, I had the great uh, honor to study with Bill Woods, and wow. at the lessons he would comp for me. And he said about piano playing, he said, uh, if, you don't, if you don't play the piano, you might be a good saxophonist, but you'll never be a good musician. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, one, of the, one of the great joys of my life uh, is I got to, uh, I've performed with Bill Woods three times uh, in a big band, and I got to record with him, uh, and this was back in, it wasn't that long ago, it was 2011. Uh, I play uh, with a group uh, that's based in Dallas called the Metroplexity Big Band, and Chris Berg is a bassist from UNT, and, and I've uh, been playing in the saxophone section. And so we had uh, 
Phil Woods as a guest artist, and this was you know just a few years ago before he passed. And um, so Chris had written a tune for him to record, and it was a, a ballad uh, that we were going to record, and he didn't know the tune. And his practicing for that was not at the horn. His practicing for that was sitting at the piano. And uh, so I, you know, I was just kind of hanging out uh, with him before he did his master class. And so he's sitting at the piano, and then we started the master class. That's what he talked about. He said, well, i got to record this tune. And, you know, and he's thinking in concert pitch, and he's dealing with it at the piano. And by seeing voice leading and seeing uh, the harmony, then he was able to go to his horn, and he was already playing it as though he had played the tune for 20 years. And uh, so I, I think that's absolutely critical. Um, yeah. So, yeah, Phil Woods, uh, what, what an amazing, uh, amazing player. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Um, I had a question about transcription. Uh, for you, is that for doing transcriptions as a whole, like I'm going to sit down and write up a solo, not necessarily write it up, but learn an entire solo, is that an ongoing process for you? Or is that something you do, um, that you still do, or that you do all the time? I'm always transcribing something. I should be always transcribing something, and I wish that I was always transcribing something. The teaching gig sometimes makes that pretty challenging. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, I'm in a process of retooling my life uh, so that I can do a whole bunch more of that, because I feel like that's absolutely a critical, a critical thing. Um, I learn more every time I transcribe something than in any other method, no matter how slow that process is. Um, who was the alto player, Logan, that was on the, uh, he was the young man who uh, was, that was the lead alto in the Grammy Jazz Band like two or three years ago? Sam Hart. Sam Hart. So this kid, uh, I don't know if any of you know uh, Sam Hart. If you do, you can give him my uh, regards. Because uh, I heard, you know, they, they put up the videos on YouTube. So this, this, this young kid, and I just loved his playing. His dad is a professional jazz guitarist in New York City. And uh, so he obviously grew up around this music. And I was blown away uh, by the way he sounded playing on F Blues. And that was the last thing I transcribed. So I took it off of YouTube and spent quite a bit of time and, and learned what he played. And it was just, it was absolutely fascinating, you know, getting that window into his into his psyche, but that's been a couple years for me since I've done that now. But yeah, I, I highly recommend that. In fact, the next part of what I wanted to speak about before I um, run out of time is just this idea of transcribing, that there really are, there really is more than one way to deal with transcription. I think that um, the, the orally going through that process, even if it's slow and painstaking and you spend two hours and you get four bars is a, is a fantastic thing. However, I do not discount the idea of working on transcriptions that other people have done. Um, I think that there's a lot of value in that kind of practice too, but I have some things uh, that I put in here that I think that are really important if you're gonna do that. Um, assuming you're first actively listening to jazz saxophone, it's working on your own transcriptions and other standard practice areas, then I would encourage serious jazz students to also spend time practicing published transcriptions of notable jazz saxophones with a few important prerequisites. And this is the most important thing. Um, Sitting down and just reading solos out of the Omni book is going to absolutely help you to become a better sight reader and play the saxophone better. But sitting and reading a solo is not necessarily going to help you to internalize that solo. So what I say is this. First thing is never, never practice a written transcription without having actively listened to the original recording many, 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 many times. You should know the solo so well you can sing along with every phrase. Pay attention to all the subtle details of how the saxophone is played, articulations, vibrato, style, rhythmic phrasing, phrasing etc. Um, that right there is sort of the key mistake that people make. If you start working on a transcription that somebody else has done and you don't know that original recording inside and out, you're going to make huge mistakes. Um, and I make a point here of saying practice on a variety of styles, not just fast tempos and not just one saxophonist. Ballads are by far more difficult, so you should always include a ballad that challenges you to match every small detail of how to play, again, with the idea of imitating everything. And then finally, uh, this next part I think is critical too. Fully memorize whatever transcription you practice. Um, if it's not completely memorized, then you've missed the point completely of internalizing vocabulary. So whereas, you know, using Charlie Parker again as an example, you have the Omni book, and okay, today I'm gonna work on ornithology, and then I'm gonna work on this, and Don Lee, and this tune. Far better to take one tune and spend a lot of time with one tune, memorize uh, the tune, memorize the chord changes, memorize the solo, and get a lot deeper with one tune. You get a greater uh, comprehension, I think, from that process. So as an example, what I have in the notes here is really just this idea of how far can we take this if we're going to analyze and look at something. So uh, my example here is Donna Lee. Donna Lee is one of those iconic melodies um, in, in, in jazz history. Uh, it's one of the tunes that everybody should learn 
uh, because the melody itself contains all of the elements of what made Charlie Parker, Charlie Parker. Uh, you know, the language that is in there, the bebop phrasing, the chromaticism, the way the lines resolve, the idea of linear harmony, that the chord changes, you know, everything doesn't necessarily line up with the chord change, but the changes are made in a linear way, melodically. Uh, it's a great tune. So there's tons of great tunes, but not all tunes are equal. Donnelly is one of those iconic tunes for sure. Um, so if we're going to study Donnelly, we get over here to this now, uh, I think it's valuable to actually look at the history of the tune. So who, I'm sure there's several of you that do know, but Donnelly is based on what? What old standard? Huh? Uh, back home in Indiana. Back home in Indiana, right? So it, and Donnelly is what's called the contrafact, written over the chord changes to back home in Indiana. There's tons of examples of this in, in this period in jazz history. Uh, you know, just off the top of my head, Hot House is based on uh, what is this thing called love? Ornithology is based on how high the moon. Lots and lots of tunes that follow this pattern. So a starting point might be to go back and say, well, where did this tune come from? I'm only going to give you a little bit of this because it's a little painful, but this is the original recording of Back Home in Indiana. So I'll let you hear it and you tell me what year you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> so this predates the first jazz recording, the original Dixieland jazz band recording. Even. When you jump ahead and where they're actually doing the chorus of the tune that you'll recognize. So there you go. I know you guys were all dying to know the origin of this, so here it is. Now, this tune's been recorded hundreds of times. Who knows who this is? This is Texas after all. Anybody know who this is? That's funny. This is Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. This is the origin of country western swing, you know, and uh, that tradition permeates Texas. It certainly is a, is a big part of the history in Oklahoma, too, where I'm from. So this is just an example of how the tune was first put into a swing context. Now something a little bit different. I want to spare you with the, uh, the vocal. Let's see you can tell me who this is. Lester Young. Lester Young. If it had not been for Lester Young, there would have never been a Charlie Parker that played the way Charlie Parker played. Lester Young's influence on this music is uh, undeniable. And he also, interestingly, got started in Oklahoma City with uh, the Blue Devils, Walter Page and the Blue Devils, which became the core of the Count Basie Orchestra. So that's um, a little bit of Lester Young. So this is the idea of saying, you know, I really want to learn about this tune. I think in classical music study, we understand this idea very clearly of really understanding the composer's intentions, you know, going back and looking at the history of the music. And I think in jazz that we don't always do this. And I think it's a, it's really important on this deeper level that you actually go back and understand where the tune came from. So again, Donnelly is a contrafact written over back home in Indiana. And I'd like to play the original recording for you for the, anybody that might have not listened to this many times. And I've provided for you in the notes over here quite a ways. I'm skipping past some of this. Um, not only the head Donnelly, uh, written in alto sax key, but also a, a, a clean transcription of what Charlie Parker played on the team. So take a minute, let's do that. Anybody know who the trumpet player is here? Charlie Parker on alto. How about the trumpet? <laughs> Miles Davis. At the age of either 18 or 19.
Researching uh, this tune. Uh, yeah, I know. It's like, uh, like you're kidding me. I mean, <laughs> it's something. So you check out recordings. Uh, and, and again, running out of time here, but you know, so you go through this process of internalizing and learning the tune first. And I think one thing that's a tried and true process uh, is learning things in all 12 keys. Uh, and that's a, quite a challenge. Um, we had uh, Bob Mincer as an artist in residence with us uh, a couple of years ago, and he gave a lecture and he was talking. Uh, he said, you know, he mentioned Donna Lee as being one of these iconic tunes. He said, now, he said, learn Donna Lee in all 12 keys. Now you've done something. You know, and I kind of took that to heart, and, and I, that became like a mission for me to play Donna Lee in all 12 keys. And uh, it's uh, why that particular tune, because of the vocabulary that's involved in this. So what we wanted to do, and I'm not going to play the entire tune in all 12 keys, I'm going to do something that's much more painful and strange sounding, and that is we're going to take the first eight bars of Donna Lee, just as an example, and play that for you in a cycle through all 12 keys. Um, the chord progression to Donna Lee in the ninth bar goes to the fourth chord of the tune. So that works out really conveniently that if we take the first eight bars, we can just loop that and move to the next key and keep on playing. Um, so you've heard the, the joke about the jazz musician that dies and goes to hell, and you know he goes and they're playing uh, A Train, you know, and they keep playing the A section, and he's like, when do, they get, when do you go to the bridge? We don't go to the bridge. Just keep going. So this kind of feels like that. As you're, for the listener, it's like, what are you doing? But we're going to do the first eight bars. I'm going to attempt to do this anyway um, and, uh, and play through it just to show you what I would do with my students as an exercise. So we'll start in A flat, concert A flat, and then we'll just go in a cycle of fours. One, two, mm, mm, mm.
Yeah, it's like, and it just keeps going through that cycle. So how do you go about doing that? Well, maybe you take the first four bars and then the first eight bars and the first, you know, 12, 16 bars, second half the tune is like the first half. Uh, so this is a process of internalization. And what I'm looking at, for me, is not it written out, but just looking at the chord changes. Um, and this is something I would point out here too, kind of to, at the end of this, is that I think for all musicians, there's this balance between what I call right brain and left brain thinking. Uh, right brain is sort of supposed to be the creative part where you just hear lines and hear shapes. So as I'm playing this, the right brain is like, okay, those are the right notes in the key of F sharp I just played, you know, which feels not very comfortable. Uh, but then the left brain is the part that's looking at the chord changes and saying, well, I know I'm going to land on the third of the chord, so I have this target note here, so if I'm in the key of uh, G flat, the second chord, the E flat seven, I know I'm aiming towards that G natural in the line, that's the third of the chord. So that's an intellectual process. Uh, so what's the right way to think? There's no answer to that. I think every musician has a balance between the two, between the uh, intellectual mathematical understanding and then the more creative natural way. So. That's kind of the idea of what I wanted to present in this. Uh, I thought it would be fun at the end maybe just to play the tune Donnelly just in one key <laughs> and, uh, and just play it. And I thought I'd uh, take advantage of the chance here. And this is my son, Logan. Uh, he is uh, a freshman music major at our program and, uh, at UCO. And uh, he's one of these, these guys, when the jazz lab opened, when I went to work, he was five years old. And uh, so no pressure here. Yeah. Uh, but he, uh, he grew up around this music. And I think for him, the process of learning this has been a very natural, organic thing because he's been to every concert and, and been around it really his whole life. So, so don't screw up the melody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up. We'll play, uh, play Donnelly and, and, and take, a, take a couple solos and then we'll call it good. Uh, any questions or anything else before we do this about anything I've talked about? Um, like I say, uh, I'm, such wonderful musicians here, and I know uh, a number of you are, are very accomplished players, and um, my hope is that this is just an approach and a thought process that might be of use to you uh, in your own practicing or in your teaching, because if you're going to be involved in jazz, you're going to be teaching. <laughs> One way or the other, it's another. All right, cool. We'll play Donnelly. No, yeah, yeah. kidding. One, two, uh-uh, uh-uh.
Thank you guys very much. I appreciate your time. Well, I'm away. Yeah. <laughs>